so maybe uh, maybe we'll get started here. Um, just want to say, yeah, welcome uh, to everybody for coming out today. Um, this is our interdisciplinary religion group. This is our last meeting for the semester in April here. My name is David. I help coordinate programs at uh, UW Center for Religion and Global Citizenry, which hosts the IRG. But beyond that, we're a general hub for interreligious dialogue, formation, and study on campus. Ulrich Rosenhagen, he's the director of the center. Um, we used to be the Lubar Institute. We have Chuck Cohen here, who is the director of the Lubar Institute. So, uh, you know, some figures here. Um, this group, the IRG, Interdisciplinary Religion Group, uh, it's a little bit more academic facing than other things we do. We bring together graduate students, postgraduates, faculty with interests in religion to share and workshop their ongoing research, discuss theoretical and practical issues involved in the study of religion, and to help form connections. Uh, across departments here at UW-Madison. So we rebooted this group this semester, having run it in the past, and we su successfully met one time this semester before, before the pandemic happened. Um, and with the messiness of everything last month, we opted not to meet. And so we're meeting again here on Zoom, and um, I think it should work out well for us. Um, we're happy to be meeting. So this is our last meeting for the semester. Uh, the, we're considering some possibilities of meeting over the summer, I think. There seems to be some interest in having a reading group. Um, the, the actual uh, substance of that kind of group is still fuzzy for us. And there's opportun maybe opportunities to do other things too. So um, if you're interested in a reading group or in something else, feel free to shoot me or Ulrich an email. You could also, uh, you could just send me a private chat in Zoom right now to say, hey, I'm interested. Some of you uh, responded on a survey that said you were interested. So we'll be contacting you at some point in the next next couple of weeks and figuring out what we can do for that. Um, yeah, and just a couple of reminders about this meeting. We are recording the meeting, so um, you may be on our recording. We're gonna post on our website. And yeah, I'm sure you've done a lot of these kinds of meetings. Um, we'd prefer it if you would mute your mic when you're not speaking. I'm looking at, and everyone is muted, so that's great, good etiquette. Um, and feel free to interact in the chat. I think Tyler will invite you to uh, to ask questions in the chat and maybe even just offer comments. So really feel free to, to be on the chat and um, as much as you like. So without further ado, I'll introduce Tyler Lehrer, our speaker here. Uh, Tyler's in his fourth year as a PhD student in the history department here at UW-Madison. Before this, he completed his MA in religious studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, studying women's ordination disputes in Sri Lanka. Tyler is a historian of early modern Indian Ocean religious and diplomatic networks. As we'll see today, his current research examines connections across Buddhist kingdoms in the Southern Asian regions, of what are now Sri Lanka and Central Thailand. His ongoing investigations aspire to chart the emergence of ethnicity and religious, political, and interregional affiliation as these became galvanized and salient in an increasingly interconnected maritime world especially in the context of the Dutch East India Company's mediation in and between these polities. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand things over to Tyler Lehrer to give us our, pres our presentation today. So thank you, Tyler. Thanks so much. Um, let's see, get into, uh, try and share my PowerPoint here. Can everybody see PowerPoint instead of me? Okay, I'm getting some nods, some thumbs up, perfect. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna start by, and how's the volume? Can everybody hear me all right? Great. Uh, it looks like in this mode, I can't see uh, the chat. So uh, I do wanna invite people to pause and uh, uh, ask me questions, uh, stop me. I realize that uh, you know, for some folks, the content, the place names, the languages, some of the material I'm gonna be working with that's my last slide, not my first slide, uh, is a little unfamiliar. So by all means, let's take opportunities to unpack some of this stuff um, in a little bit greater detail. So maybe uh, I might rely on David to help uh, mediate that process because I, I sort of lost all of my uh, controls. Um, so I wanna thank the center, the IRG, Dr. Rosenhagen, David, um, and probably countless other people who worked really hard to make this happen. Um, as I mentioned, I really wish we could all be together in the same physical space, but it's actually super cool that so many of you um, from all different parts of the world have tuned in. Um, and so I'm super grateful and, and really, really excited about that. Um, what I wanna do is uh, 
start the talk by giving a little bit of my trajectory of how I got into this world uh, of Buddhism and politics in the, in the Indian Ocean zone. Um, and that story starts with experiences with Buddhist and South and Southeast Asian communities in Northern California, where I grew up. Um, and that led to an early fascination, kind of like shortly after high school, really, with monasticism, Buddhist monasticism and uh, ordination specifically. Um, that then in turn led to a real interest in um, controversies over the ordination of Buddhist women, uh, which was a, a world that I kind of found myself on the periphery of as many of the Buddhist communities in Northern California that I was connected to happened to be at the center of parts of that dispute. And I'm going to talk about all of this and show some really cool pictures. Um, and, and really spending time with many of these Buddhist women um, seeking the ordination or not seeking the ordination really led to much more complex and historically informed interests in some of the connections between lineage making uh, and political formations, especially as lineage and political formations became mutually imbricated in these really fascinating geographic kinds of networks, both contemporarily in terms of women's ordination, but then also in the early modern period and, and before too. So then uh, I wanna think about uh, that 18th century Indian Ocean world from the perspective of the major stakeholders in my story. The uh, kingdom of predominantly Buddhist courtly life in the center of what's now Sri Lanka, a kingdom we now call the Kandian kingdom. Uh, a similar kingdom uh, on the opposite side of the Bay of Bengal in what's now central Thailand, the seat of Siamese court and state power, the Ayutthaya kingdom, and then the really surprising way in which they were linked together during this period by some of the maritime and political and economic prowess and ambitions of the Dutch East India Company. Uh, so those are sort of the first two of three parts of my talk. And then where I'd like to end up, um, if we have time, is the really surprising and fascinating places that this story shows up, in particular in the early 20th century uh, in the popular historical composition of a Thai crown prince, Damrong Rajanupap, who writes about Buddhist decline and revival in the early modern Indian Ocean zone. And so as I mentioned, as we go along, please uh, feel free to, to stop and ask questions and, and um, ask for clarification or you know, anything as we go along. Um, think of it in maybe a, a kind of an informal lecture type format. Um, so let's get into it. Any questions so far? So how did I get interested in, in Buddhist histories in South and Southeast Asia? Um, like many non-Asian, European, American, Australian uh, friends, I got into Buddhism by hanging out at Borders Books and Barnes and Noble uh, after school. Uh, I read like everything I could in high school about Buddhism. I was just like that flavor of nerd, I guess. And uh, quickly decided that I was interested very quickly with what was presented to me in the kind of Barnes and Noble Buddhism section as Theravada, um, not Tibetan Buddhism, not Zen Buddhism. I was really interested in what I understood then to be uh, a tradition that presented itself as the most authentic, the most pure. Like that was just into my like 19 year old brain. That was like so fascinating. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I grew up in Sacramento. Um, Northern California is one of the most Buddhist places in the world with temples and practice communities um, of just about every imaginable form. And so there was a small Sri Lankan temple in West Sacramento, uh, headed by three Sri Lankan monastics. And in the summer of 2008, I just started hanging out there, um, going to meditation classes, uh, going to rituals that were predominantly geared toward the local Sri Lankan expat community, and kind of just fell in love with that scene in a weird way, really fell in love with the culture and especially the food. Um, so in the following summer, after kind of hanging around that community for a year, um, I asked the head monk here, if you can see my mouse pointer here in the center of the top right photo, uh, a senior monk named Madhavela Silavimala uh, from a temple, those of you who are familiar with Sri Lanka, he's from uh, just outside of Kurunegala. Uh, 
if he would be willing to ordain me as a novice. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, in Sri Lanka, at least, temporary ordination is not really at all very common. But in Thailand and a lot of mainland Southeast Asian forms of monasticism, for young adolescent males to ordain as a monk, either a novice or a full monk for a summer, uh, usually around three months, although sometimes maybe up to a year, is an incredibly common practice. And in some, in many respects, it's like a, a kind of a rite of passage, a, a socializing sort of rite of passage that makes a male, in many respects, deemed to be fit for marriage, I think. Uh, in Sri Lanka, it's not at all as popular, but you know, these monks in this community were very aware of that practice in Thailand, uh, and they were willing to indulge my curiosity and desire to have this experience. So I ordained as a monk for a summer. Um, the following year, in 2010, I really wanted to, to push this forward and see if that was something I really wanted to do. Uh, and it was really only a few months after the end of the 26 year uh, civil war in Sri Lanka. And I went just kind of as like a Buddhist tourist on my own um, and traveled around the country with monks. Only about, you know, maybe about half, half of the country was available for foreign tourists to, to visit at the time, um, in large part because I, I believe. Um, of course, ongoing political instability, demining operations. But what I what now occurs to me is I don't think they wanted people taking photos of uh, the large IDP camps that were in the north, uh, northern third of the island. So I could only go as far north as uh, many of you will recognize. This is Sigiriya and Mahintale was about as far uh, into north into the cultural triangle as uh, a white tourist could get at that time. Um, so I just travel around with monks and you know really uh, continued to explore those communities. Um, and around this time, 2008 to around 2012, there was a massive international debate circulating in the broader Theravadan communities about the legality and the merits of ordaining Buddhist women um, as fully ordained nuns. Now, many of the monastic communities that I was connected to in Northern California happened to really be part of this uh, dispute. Now, here, and this is a photo I took at a really remarkable event that I was fortunate to attend in, uh, I, I can't actually remember now that I'm looking at my slide, if this was in August of 2009 or 2010. Um, I'm such a good historian I am. But this was, it was advertised, the first dual sangha, and I'm going to explain this a little bit, uh, ordination for female, for women monastics uh, conducted in a self-identified Theravadan style or tradition in the Western Hemisphere. So what this means, uh, the kind of dominant paradigm that is agreed upon by some of the loudest and most powerful voices in the international monastic scene in this world, uh, hold that in order for a woman to take higher ordination as a nun, she has to receive first an ordination from a quorum of her peers, fully ordained women. Um, and then that ordination is then supplemented by another one that kind of seals the deal, so to speak, with a quorum of male ordained monastics. Now, in around the, by the end of the 11th century in Sri Lanka, um, the lineage of women monastics, it's, the word in, in Pali here is bhikkhuni, uh, died out for reasons that we, none of us will have enough time to really go into. Uh, the male monastic dispensation was resuscitated in about 1076, bringing monks in from Burma. Uh, whether or not there were nuns in mainland Southeast Asia or not is a really interesting historical debate. Nevertheless, uh, in these kinds of legit, highly legitimized forms of institutionalized Theravada monastic practice, it's widely understood that there are no longer quorums of fully ordained monastic women to give the ordination. So starting in the late 1980s and 1990s, there have been a number of really high profile international attempts to do precisely that. Um, and as Claire, who introduced herself in the beginning, is working on a really, really, really amazing MA project at Cornell right now, 
um, that's going to think about some of these transnational networks between Thailand and Sri Lanka. But here's one that happened between Thailand and the US uh, in, in 2010, where you had a number of Sri Lankan and Thai monastics willing to participate in a bhikkhuni ordination at the risk of being excommunicated from their own temple networks. And I just happened to be here um, and kind of got to tag along and attend this thing. And, and it was a remarkable, beautiful four hour event in which four women uh, received this contested higher ordination. Um, a German, a Canadian, and two Americans, if I remember, although I might not have that quite right. Um, and then it had an immediate fallout back in Australia and in Thailand and Chiang Mai, the kind of centers of the Wat Nong Papong uh, monastic lineage that, that many of these women had belonged to up to this point. And so I was already very interested in how something that took place in the redwoods of Northern California could have such an acrimonious and wide ranging fallout in Thailand. Uh, these, these kinds of discursive uh, connections were already, although I wasn't yet in grad school at this point, I was just like a Buddhist nerd. Um, I was already very interested in, in how that could happen. So I went uh, and I enrolled in an MA program and I, I, in religious studies at the University of Colorado because I just was like, this was like the thing that I was kind of good at. And uh, I'm looking at the chat. Yeah. So the question is, can I let people know what temple in Thailand this was? Uh, yeah, Claire, it was, from what I understand, this is uh, the kind of Western monastic dispensation that came out of Ajahn Chah's Wat Nong Pa Pong or Wat Pa Nana Chat in Ubon Ratatani in the northeastern part of Thailand, kind of along the Lao border. This was a, 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 a monastic tradition that very early on, and Professor Bowie and probably Professor McGovern may have a lot more knowledge about this, but very early on gave the full higher ordination to males uh, from the US, Australia, parts of Europe, Canada. Um, and they very quickly established their own centers in those countries. Uh, and it's some of those monastics that were part of this ordination who then lost their affiliation with that Wat Nong Pa Pong uh, lineage affiliation. Um, so yes, I think it is that temple that you're thinking of. Um, so those of you who are kind of familiar with this story will recognize this photo as Bikuni Kusuma. Um, in 1996, she received maybe one of the first sort of public dual Sangha bhikkhuni ordinations um, in Sarnath, India, with South Korean women conferring the first half of the ordination and Sri Lankan and Indian, much more closely self-identifying Theravada monks uh, giving the sort of the male side. Caused an uproar, just like uh, the 2010 one did. Um, but in, many people sort of regard her and she sort of regards herself, and I think uh, this is probably quite accurate, as probably the first self-identified Theravada and bhikkhuni who's sort of been willing to go public with this that we have extant records of um, since, you know, the 19th century. Um, so really, really, really remarkable person, really remarkable story. And I think a lot of her contributions in the kind of burgeoning academic literature of bhikkhuni ordination, um, she gets oftentimes really ignored. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight some of her really amazing contributions. Now, I want to linger for just a few more moments to think about women's ordination because I, I, I think it's going to be a really nice lead in into the meat of my uh, really speculative historical arguments and, and material in the 18th century Indian Ocean. And I want to play a couple of clips really briefly. Um, let me see if I can open up the chat here. For those of you for whom it might be easier to do this on your own device, I'm going to just share a link. I'm going to, and then I might as well, while I'm at it, share the next one too. Um, and these are just a couple of quick clips that I shot at a bhikkhuni ordination in the summer of 2018 um, while I was there doing research for this project, just in case you've never heard Pali being chanted or seen something like a, a Buddhist ordination. Um, so I'm going to shut up for a second and just play this um, just for a few seconds. Can I get a thumbs up if you can hear? 
So what's happening here is the first kind of half of an ordination where uh, my friend, the, the candidate for ordination in the, the kind of brighter yellow robe is being questioned by two members of the, uh, the women's monastic sangha about her suitability for the ordination. And this will then take place again um, in another building on another part of this property um, with the male monastic sangha to kind of demonstrate the, the tremendous amount of ritual decorum um, and attention and care that goes into this. There are ideas about Pali chanting that it has to be pronounced perfectly. It has to be understood by sentient beings. Um, it has to be done with a well-intentioned heart in order for these rituals to be valid. And again, this, the idea of one becomes a monk or a nun, one becomes a monastic, uh, at least in the textual ideal of these traditions, right? because it's understood to be the tradition most conducive for, uh, you know, practicing meditation and cultivating merit for oneself, for one's family, for society. Of course, why folks become monastics nowadays is not at all necessarily reflective of that textual ideal. But I think, and this is part of the argument of my master's project, for a lot of women, they communicate their desire or their legitimacy or suitability for taking these ordinations in these very idealistic soteriological terms. Um, so I'm gonna maybe skip the next video, but it's that second YouTube link. And if you just want some beautiful shots of uh, a women's ordination in Sri Lanka, please uh, check it out. Um, but I do want to maybe move along a little bit um, to get into the meat of our, you know, why we're all here. So my speculative paper, I want to draw us first into the 18th century Indian Ocean um, to examine a remarkable coordinated effort to revive a monastic ordination lineage on the island of Lanka. And I'm going to call it Lanka before the current nation state time to try and avoid some conflation between the borders of the current nation state and this political formation. Um, on the island, which this connection, this coordinated ordination effort um, was the product of a short-lived but nevertheless enthusiastic religious and diplomatic interlude between what was the last independent kingdom on the island, a Siamese, court headquartered, uh, Siamese kingdom headquartered in Ayutthaya, and as I mentioned, the Dutch East India Company. I want to introduce this remarkable story from the perspective of each of these three stakeholders. First, the micro and macro politics of the Candian court on the island of Lanka. Next, the intellectual and ritual dimensions of the Ayutthian Buddhist world. And finally, the VOC, the Dutch East India Company's participation in a multi-local Buddhist lineage transmission. Uh, so that's the kind of second part of my paper. And then to the extent we have time, I want to end up with this guy here, uh, Prince Damarang Rajanupap, who uh, wrote in 1914 a popular history on that, on that 18th century Buddhist ordination mission. I'm giving the title sort of tentatively as On the Reestablishment of the Siamese Sangha in Lanka. Those of you who are familiar with the Thai, you'll recognize Rung Praditsatang Pratsyang Wong Nai Lanka Tawi. Um, as I may have mentioned, it was published, he wrote it in 1914. It was republished again in 1960, and this is the edition you see the cover of here as part of a cremation volume uh, for the death of the Supreme Patriarch. And then again, most recently in 2013, uh, I'm sorry, 2003, for the 260th anniversary of this successful reordination mission. Um, many of you will already know, but I'll go ahead and, and for the benefit of those who don't, Damrang was the half brother of King Rama V, uh, Prince uh, or King Chulalongkorn, who reigned from uh, I think uh, 1982 or I'm sorry 1892 to 1915. Uh, Damrang was commander of the army. He was minister of the interior, and in many respects, the major formulator of Thailand's education system. After this long career in uh, the rapidly expanding arms of the Thai monarchy's bureaucratic state, he took up, it seems, the historical vocation in his retirement and authored amongst many, many, many texts during this period, um, this one that I'm interested in, an over 500 page uh, 
uh, popular history that details decline and revival of Buddhism on Lanka, a, no a country on the other side of the Indian Ocean, um, but which emphasizes Ayutthaya's role, sort of working with and through the Dutch East India Company to revive the Sangha, the Buddhist dispensation on that island. Um, and so ultimately then it's Damrong's publication, the rhetorical, the religious, the political uses to which an early 20th century history of Buddhist decline, revival and networked connection in the 18th century could have been put um, that my argument today um, will ultimately consider. So that Sri Lankan monastic ordination, um, the word in Pali is Upasampada, which is referred to as the Siam Nikaya. And in Pali, Nikaya means something like fraternity, lineage, or chapter. Siam, of course, refers to Siam. Um, dates back to an ordination which took place in Kandy, in the center of the island, in 1753, of a quorum of Lankan novice monks at the Malvata Rajamaha Vihara. And I'm going to show you some cool pictures of all of these places. Um, by monks who had arrived from Batavia, the center of the Dutch East India Company's center of power, from the court of King Bromkot um, in the heart of Siam. Now, despite similar importations of Burmese monks in 1597 and again in the 1680s, by the 1730s, there were no longer quorums of fully ordained monks to give that upasampada. So there were no more uh, fully ordained monks left on the island, we understand. Now, in brief, Portuguese hostility toward monastic forms, declining local patronage of institutions, saw the erosion of centralized ecclesiastical structures, centers of learning, and pedagogy. Many of you will recognize this as uh, Anne Blackburn's argument. Um, during this time, then, the Sangha was left with only non-ordained so-called Gananansi ritual specialists who did not have the higher ordination, who were uh, maintaining the temples, monastic wealth, lineage succession, this sort of thing. Now, one of these figures, um, a monk named Velavita Saranankara, and here we see him on the right here in this temple painting from the Malvata Vihara, uh, became quite well known at that point for his aptitude with Pali texts, meditation, and, and sort of how to be a good monk. And he rose to the attention of the Kandian court, where he petitioned first uh, King Sri Vijaya Rajasingha, and then his successor, who we see here, Kirti Sri Rajasingha, to try and revive opportunities for, for full ordination once again by bringing in monks from off the island. Um, under Sri Vijaya, uh, Kirti Sri's uh, predecessor, the VOC had sought monks from Arakan in what's now Burma, as had been done before several times, but in probably because of political instability in the Irrawaddy region, they resettled on Ayutthian monks. Now, I want to pause to just think about how remarkable it is that uh, we have letters in the Dutch National Archive um, in which you have representatives for Kandy ask asking representatives of the Dutch VOC to go and find proper or suitable monks. Now, what that could possibly have meant to the Dutch VOC at that time is something I'm very keen to reconstruct in some of the dissertation chapters. But it's just remarkable that the, you know, with all this attention and care about lineage purity and so on, I mean, this was the only uh, power they had available to work through to try and get monks from abroad. But I, I just am just astounded by that fact. Um, so eventually then in 1753, under the reign of King Kirti Shri, approximately 17 Ayutthian monks who were led by the Vinaya masters Pra Upali and Pra Aryamuni from a temple off the Ayutthian so-called island where the Chopraya splits into two, uh, called Wat Tamaram, and I'm going to show you some pictures of that too, arrived at the port in Trincomalee on the northeastern side of the Lankan Island, where they were enthusiastically brought to Kandy in palanquins in a grand diplomatic overture, com complete with a huge retinue of, of servants and attendants. Now, within a year, by 1754, hundreds of these Upasampada ordinations had been conducted at the Malvata and the Gedige Rajmaha Viharas. I had Gedige in the previous uh, photo, and here's the Malvata Vihara. Um, more monks, texts, and gifts arrived in 1756. Um, and finally, again, in 1760, a final VOC ship arrived from Ayutthaya. Um, and this time, 
it carried one of the Ayutian king Boromakot's supposedly 108 sons, uh, the crown prince Teapipi. Uh, now, the, this prince was disguised as a monk. He was wearing robes, his head was shaved. Um, and as I understand from the Ayutian chronicles, he was exiled from Siam for mismanaging the court's wealth. Um, and was sent with that third contingent of monks in 1760. And get this, um, in case a planned assassination attempt on this king, Kirti Shri, um, was successful. So the Siamese monks, many of the newly ordained Kandian monks, and a handful of high-ranking uh, Kandian ministers, despite all of these sort of public displays of Buddhist piety, working through a colonial power to get monks from abroad, um, they attempted to assassinate him. More on that soon, I promise. Uh, so in this first section then, and I'm going to lay out a few more of these stakes, what I want to suggest by way of an argument is that this mobilization took place at the nexus of connected commercial, religious, and political formations. The VOC's balance sheet in South and Southeast Asia affected their willingness to mediate a, a multi-local lineage transmission on behalf of uh, uh, indigenous elites, you know, they were effectively patrons of a Buddhist revival. Meanwhile, tensions in Burma and Thailand affected Ayutthaya's willingness to part with some of its most valuable monks and texts. Uh, tensions between the southeastern coast of India and micropolitics of Kandy also impacted this story. So what I want to suggest is that um, in Sanjay Subramaniam connected historical style, that the religious discourses, religious stories, uh, religious histories of lineage formation and transmission have oftentimes been studied um, outside of these larger commercial or political colonial formations and vice versa. And I think these are all part of a much more robust, sophisticated and nuanced story in which these discourses and, and uh, formations are mutually imbricating one another. So that's sort of by way of my, my kind of speculative argument here at this point with this material. And I want to now dig into maybe some of those details. Um, just to check in, do we have any questions? Are we, everybody, are we doing okay? All right, so by around 1710, we have what I've been referring to as the Kandian Kingdom, still independent and largely landlocked in the center of the island, surrounded on almost all sides with the exception of access to, I think, a port in Chilau and, and maybe Putalam, um, uh, basically deprived of access to the entire littoral ring um, and thus any kind of trans-regional trade that would have been mediated through its ports. Um, it was ruled, as I mentioned, by a dynasty of self-consciously foreign-born Southeast Indian kings from the Nayakar dynasty, who would have inhabited a kind of ritual and religious milieu, uh, which we would now associate with the kind of a Shaivite Hinduism and not Buddhism. Um, and by virtue of a multi-local political alliance between Kandian elites and that Nayakar dynasty, uh, several of uh, the descendants of these Nayakar elites were sent down to Kandy to take the throne, including the two kings that I'm interested in. Um, and because of this, and these were the last four Kandian kings to rule before this independent kingdom finally fell to the British in 1815, um, I think it makes sense that many of them were very eager to cultivate a Buddhist en primature to try and help root their legitimacy on a throne which probably would have made ritual and uh, cultural demands that, you know, Kirti Shri, from what I understand, assumed the throne at age 16 or quite young, you know, a Telugu speaking Shaivite Hindu to use maybe an anachronistic um, identifier, but nevertheless, you know, very quickly had to uh, reinvent himself uh, in, in a way that would have proved his legitimacy for rule amongst a, a social, religious, and political milieu um, that might not have been very familiar to him initially at all. Um, so as I mentioned then, in 1760, many of those Kandian courtiers uh, attempted to assassinate him. And I think what this suggests is that uh, for Kirti Shri and a lot of these kings, political and economic pressure from outside, the Dutch VOC, the Portuguese, then the Dutch, and then the British, um, certainly was not um, the only or potentially even the most pressing political threat um, to stability and legitimacy of their rule. 
uh, despite popular Buddhist narratives of a virtuous autonomous king like Ashoka, who can wield power, uh, you know, just through the might of their ethical prowess. In fact, power was carefully wielded in tenuous negotiation with elite aristocrats and many of them grew increasingly suspicious of its centralization in the hands of a foreign-born dynasty. Um, as, you know, a little bit more detail here, Kirti Shri's grandfather, uh, Vira, Vira Parakrama Narendra Sinha, who reigned from about 1707 to 1739, then we would understand as the last, and I'm using scare quotes, ethnically Sinhala king, um, he fathered no children with his chief consort, and so um, because of that pre-existing uh, relationship with the Vijayanagara Empire, or the, I'm sorry, the Nayakar Empire, um, when he fathered no children with his chief consort, and apparently there were no more suitably high caste women left on the island, possibly also because of Portuguese colonial encroachment, the lineage then went to um, the next of kin, which happened to be on, in the southern coast of India. The same thing happened again then with the next succession with Kirti Shri. Um, so these tensions and power struggles at the Kandian court, I want to suggest kind of by way of hopefully moving on, provided both opportunities for control as well as threat for Kirti Shri and for the VOC. Um, so long as courtiers and aristocrats were internally divided into these clamoring factions, king and company could play them off of one another. However, for these elite Sinhalese aristocrats and for the VOC, the threat of foreign strategic alliances and the erosion of local power were also quite threatening. Um, the Lankan historian Lorna de Raja has suggested that the reasons given for the assassination um, of a king who had worked so publicly and so demonstrably for the cause of Buddhism was despite these public performances of, of Buddhist piety, it was still believed that he was you know, doing Hindu rituals. Um, what seems more likely, and, and and uh, John Holt and several others have made this argument is that it really was a kind of a political power grab and they really resented this and, and potentially tried to use this as an opportunity. Those of you who were able to access the much longer pre-circulated version of my paper, I threw in a really rough translation of a 1762 uh, communication um, that was reported to the Dutch East India Company governor in Colombo here in the, in the capital. Um, from several of their spies who were kind of working on their behalf in the Kandian kingdom, um, in which it suggests that A, the Dutch actually knew um, about this and were actively sanctioning a potential overthrow of this king. Um, although there's some argument about that in uh, the historiography, but that as well, um, the prince, the, the Siamese prince who came from the Ayutthaya kingdom, King Bromukot's uh, son, not only was complicit in this plot, um, but as well, uh, that once he was forced off the island and, and he sort of floated around a couple of different places, he was also in communication with the Dutch for, for several more months, attempting to maybe get him back onto the island. So there's a lot of really rich material here in the Dutch National Archive that I just started to, to really um, uh, assess. So can, to move on, Candy's and Ayutthaya's enthusiastic but short-lived moment of religious and diplomatic correspondence was mediated by the commercial ambition of the Dutch East India Company, whose maritime economic strength made this revival possible in the first place. Um, it was increasingly keen to gain favor with these Southern Asian elites amidst stagnating trade profits. The VOC's commercial and political fortunes in both Lanka and Ayutthaya were decreasingly secure throughout the 18th century due to declining profits and numerous internal factors, such as dissent amongst um, Batavia, so-called Batavia and Colombo-centric factions of the company's administration. There was a lot of uh, infighting and uh, you know, power struggles, of course, within the Dutch East India Company as well for how to direct and assert the flow of goods and resources and trade. Um, and you had governors in Colombo who wanted to be the center of action, who wanted to create a trading network um, with equal stature and importance to the one centered in Batavia, the, head, the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company in Asia. And so they really struggled uh, throughout the late 17th century um, with these competing visions and really broke the bank doing so. Um, and so 
uh, in the 18th century then, um, in large part, the situation led to um, the necessity to advance increasingly expensive, innovative, and collaborative diplomatic projects carried out on behalf of indigenous elites um, in both of these places whose seemingly mercurial good favor was always necessary, but even more so for the company's balance sheet. Um, now, I want to transition to thinking about Ayutthaya. Um, just over a decade before it would fall to the Burmese in 1767, this lineage transmission took place during the waning decades of Ayutthaya's own transregional supremacy as a really powerful center of Indian Ocean trade and accumulated, but according to Chris Baker and Pasuk Pompachit's new book, Mismanaged Wealth. Um, Ayutthaya was increasingly eager to play up its Buddhist vitality and to return the quote unquote gift of the Dharma back to Lanka, the island where, you know, its own Buddhist dispensations were largely constructed and in reference to or solidified in the 13th and 14th century. Now, to, cons to maybe summarize just a few pages um, from a paper I wrote for Professor Hansen, um, at the center of this broad Indian Ocean, quote unquote, Theravada Buddhist imaginary, to quote uh, Stephen Collins, was this island of Lanka, um, which had first adopted these forms of Buddhism by the third century BCE as a result of the missionizing projects of the Indian Emperor Ashoka. Um, and for Collins, this imaginaire constitutes Pali literature's working fulcrum in which these religious and historical formations are articulatable in terms of uh, ideas about human flourishing. Um, with long-standing links to the subcontinent, I'm talking about the island of Lanka, and its own really impressive record of Pali and Sanskrit textual composition and monastic reform under the patronage of self-avowed Buddhist kings, um, for burgeoning kingdoms of Pali identifying Buddhists, and I'm saying Pali identifying because I don't want to use the word Theravada, uh, in mainland Southeast Asia after about the 10th century, these Lankan forms of uh, meditational and textual praxis, uh, and this is of course the Mahavihara, carried a really powerful social and political and religious imprimatur in the mainland Southeast Asian Mon, Khmer, and Sukhothai kingdoms. And then with the importation of new ordaining, now back to Lanka, um, with new ordaining monks from the Ramanya kingdom in what's now Burma, um, to Poland Ruba in Lanka under the Lankan king Vijayabahu in 1076. Um, and this was the event in which a male monastic Sangha was brought back to the island after it had gone into its most precipitous decline, but not a female one. Um, again, then in the mid to late 15th century, this happened again from, Lung, uh, from mainland Southeast Asia to Lanka. And then finally, my dissertation projects focus on a third cluster of reimportations from mainland Southeast Asia um, in the mid 18th century. Uh, knowledge about this broader network uh, was sustained by inscriptional and textual records of these monastic reordination and lineage expansion moments and transmissions. Um, in a recent chapter that just came out in, a, in an edited volume with University of Hawaii Press, Alexei Kirichenko has this really fascinating argument um, that expansive networks of monastic mobility that extended between Lanka, the Thai territories, and potentially as far northwest as the Burman Yunnan borderlands were sustained by this uh, mutually beneficial awareness of a broader Buddhist world that transcended these contemporaneous maritime and political boundaries, porous, of course, as they doubtlessly were, um, and also by the numerous benefits that royal patrons and ambitious monastics alike could have could gain by periodic revivals and diplomatic contacts with foreign polities. Um, so I want to then switch into the kind of final section then. And to think about where does this story end up? Where does it go? Uh, how does this story then become part of this broader, uh, uh, you know, political and religious um, uh, uh, flow across the Indian Ocean that does all sorts of interesting work? So I want to argue then in this sort of final section that this lineage transmission is a galvanizing moment um, 
or rather a defining moment in the galvanization of a form of multi-local historical subjectivity, one that is invoked and imagined to do social, political, and religious work. And by work, I'm thinking about uh, the work-like aspects of what textual composition does, a la Dominic Lecapra, the intellectual historian. Um, that these histories do these kinds of these forms of work in colonial Ceylon, in post-colonial Sri Lanka, and especially in Siam and Thailand. Uh, in considering some of the historical afterlives of the success of this lineage transmission, um, in my case, as it was wielded by Buddhist popular historians like Prince Damrong, uh, we can better appreciate how they both drew on and hopefully see how they contribute to centuries old modes of religious and pedagogical exegesis, making use of these stories of revival in the early 20th century uh, to shore up forms of Buddhist identification um, amidst any number of potential uh, social or religious projects and anxieties. I am not at all um, an expert in like yet what was really happening in 19th and 20th century Thailand, but one can picture, of course, the British and the French colonial powers sort of squeezing um, uh, the Chakri dynasty in, that dynasty responding by creating all kinds of new, uh, innovative bureaucratic and state apparatuses of which Damrong was at the helm. And so in what ways maybe is this much earlier moment of colonial encroachment and how these two Buddhist kings worked the main European colonizer on the scene at that time um, into sort of patronizing a, a, a Buddhist lineage transmission. What resonances would that have had for somebody like Damrong? Um, in the early 20th century. I don't know yet, but I'm hot on the heels of trying to reconstruct and, and find that out. Um, so any questions before I delve into this? I had a question, Tyler. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, so uh, Sri Lanka, Lanka understood and kind of remembered as this fount of uh, Pali or Theravada Buddhist Buddhist life that that gets tra transmitted to Southeast Asia is the reciprocal true does, does Lanka understand itself in this way as well um, does it understand itself as like we are you know we have such this, this great Im important historical role in the transmission of Buddhism and and why is it that we're without this lineage now is um or is it just remembered outside of Lanka yeah, that's a really, really fantastic question. Um, and the answer is absolutely a resounding yes. Um, that kind of impressive record of Pali and Sanskrit uh, composition I referenced um, includes a lot of really interesting um, chronicles about the transmission of Buddhism from the Indian subcontinent to Lanka, for instance, under um, Indian emperors, right? And a lot of those texts include really fascinating kind of like pre-lives of the dispensation before it arrives in Lanka. So one I have in mind um, are texts like the Mahavangsa or a collection of literature collectively referred to as Vangsa, um, which are the Buddhist inflected historical chronicles of the island written under the patronage of these kings. And in one, in several instances, there's a really, really, really well-known discourse in the Mahavangsa where long before Buddhism makes it to the island, uh, while the Buddha is alive uh, teaching and wandering in the borderlands of what's now Uttar Pradesh and Nepal, right? Uh, he comes down to the island, he flies, he floats down to the island of Lanka because Buddhas can do these sorts of things. Um, and has a conversation with devas, this sort of like middling uh, uh, godlike creatures and says, you know, at some point in the future, a virtuous king is going to uh, proliferate a pure, wonderful, lovely, amazing, super awesome doctrine. And this place is where it will thrive and, uh, you know, uh, assume one of its highest, loftiest expressions. And that is to be protected at all costs. And in fact, a lot of the scholarship about um, much of this literature that's come out in the last few decades has actually been investigating the extent to which those discourses become part of uh, national, you know, contemporary, contemporary xenophobic or nationalist projects. But you're absolutely right that, uh, or your hunch that, that Lanka has a lot of these really, really, really old, really celebrated, uh, really well institutionalized textual and um, 
just discursive technologies for positioning itself at, at the center of this sort of world. Um, understanding, of course, that this is kind of a second millennium phenomenon, right? Buddhism was born and sort of took root in what's now India. Um, and for all sorts of historical reasons, um, you know, largely died out there. So by the second millennium, it was kind of Lanka that uh, worked really assiduously to position itself as, the, as you said, a fountainhead of this, of this formation or this dispensation. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so I want to suggest that, you know, at least these Thai Buddhist histories like Damrong's of the lineage transmission maybe give us glimpses into a mode of historical composition which rather than centrally aspiring to represent the past as a positivistic account of what really happened, um, instead, at least centrally, aspire to create ethical Buddhists in the present, um, inculcating them and by extension us into historical subjectivities which are indebted to the successes of these virtuous Buddhist monks and kings in the past, monks, nuns, and kings in the past. Um, whether oral, oral, heard, visual, textual, um, Buddhist histories uh, invite their listeners, their readers, their viewers to become stewards of ongoing vitality and preservation in the present. Um, I want to show in my dissertation eventually that these modes and contexts in which the success of this particular monastic revival gets narrated across Southern Asia can maybe give us uh, clues into these interregional processes um, coming to identify operational forms of difference. Now, I want to be really careful to note that in the 18th century, I'm using difference because ethnicity, religion, uh, uh, race, class, were not really galvanized uh, discourses yet. Of course, by the 20th century, um, much of these processes had gained quite a bit of intellectual steam. But nevertheless, uh, folks in the Indian Ocean region identified one, of them, one another and made judgments about what, one another. What were the technologies they used to do so, and, and how do they continue to um, accrue more and more and more meaning and utility through these successive historical waves and periods. Sort of a, a background question animating a lot of this research. Um, but in addition to, I think, a lot of the political or rhetorical uses to which some of these projects, uh, some of these histories are put, I also think that they give us really captivating glimpses into the emotions and just quotidian experiences of everyday people. Um, in who lived increasingly mobile lives in this part of the world. And I'll give you an example of that here in a moment. Um, so back to Damrong. He wrote his text amidst these potentially destabilizing British and French colonial projects in the early 20th century. Uh, the, the Thai monarchy was developing all kinds of innovative technologies to maybe rise to that occasion to demonstrate its own uh, uh, its own internal colonial ambitions, its own, uh, you know, ca capacities to those colonial powers for all sorts of reasons that folks like Professor Bowie and Tamara Luce have produced all kinds of rich arguments about. Um, but maybe in this moment, um, leading up to the 1932 revolution, these kinds of anti-colonial, anti-royalist growing pains, I wonder what this story really did for him. Um, and I don't know yet. So this is a, this is a question I'm, I'm putting out to, to those of you who research this century much more closely than I do to maybe speculate irresponsibly or not so irresponsibly with me. Um, but nevertheless, why did he tell this story? Why was he so interested in talking about early modern Lanka? What did it do for him? Who was his audience? Um, these are all questions that I'm, I'm really continuing to work with. So let's, let's actually jump into, and we're starting to wrap up here, um, a couple of quick sections from his text. <clears throat> now, before I do that, I just want to show you, like, Upali, right, um, whose name you see in a couple of places here, was the head Ayutthian monk sent by King Buramkot from Ayutthaya, um, whose, whose own ordination lineage then becomes the sort of seed or germ of the Siam Nikaya, um, you know, which now comprises something like maybe 60 or 65 percent of maybe all monks in Lanka right now. I mean, it's a hugely important monastic dispensation. And so the, the, the Ayutthaya monk at the center of it in Lanka, in, in Thailand, is like 
you know, this venerated figure. I mean, he's all over temples in Ayutthaya. You can pay like a hundred baht and, you know, make merit to him. Um, there's coloring books about him. This image on the right, for those of you who have been to the Malvata temple, so two images on the left are from Thailand. The one on the right is um, in Lanka, but he shows up like everywhere. Like, I, ha I don't know who this Thai fashion model person is or what she has to do with this, but, you know, he just is like that well known, I guess. Um, and it's just really kind of kooky to me and, and really fascinating. Um, so the museum where Upali and his cohort of ordaining monks came from, as I mentioned, those of you who are familiar with the geography of Thailand know that Ayutthaya is kind of like a, where the Chao Phraya River splits into two and rejoins itself a few kilometers south. And Wat Tamaram is just off the left west, western bank of that kind of island. Um, and in 2003, concomitant with the republication of Damrong's text, uh, the Thai and Sri Lankan governments jointly put together some funds and built a museum uh, kind of devoted to this lineage transmission. Um, and those of you who know me know that like I'm a super nerd about ordination platforms uh, in Thai Ubosot uh, or in Sinhala uh, Sima Malakaya. So like every temple I went to, I always take pictures of the ordination platforms. And it was just astounding to me to think about uh, the, the ritual legitimacy of the majority of Sri Lanka's modern monastic institutions traces back to this tiny little Ubosot you know, on like this little lot on the edge of Ayutthaya where like no tourists go and like two monks live now um, is another one of these just historical connections that I, I you know, just blows my mind. Um, nevertheless, there's some, atten you know, renewed attention to this. And as I suggested, they built this museum in 2003. Um, and you walk in and there's a quote right on the wall from Damrong's text, just right there. Um, and I'll just give the translation. Um, it's clear that the Siamese deputation of monks tasked with performing the higher ordination on the island of Lanka had made a major sacrifice, even to the point of endangering their lives on a dangerous journey for the cause of the Buddhist Dhamma. Their achievement, lauded for its record of vitality and success, is seen in the regrounding of that dispensation on the earth. Of those 18 monks comprising the Upali mission, only seven returned to Siam, and Upali, we know, did not. The text at the outset really emphasizes the precarity and the difficulty of the journey um, undertaken with pious motivation. It suggests that despite the risks of the mission, precisely because it was conducted in the service of Buddhist virtues, the desire to propagate the Siamese monastic lineage back onto the island, um, that it was ultimately successful. Uh, the pers this perspective shows up in all kinds of exhibits throughout the museum, and this one I just love. Um, there are multimedia, like, videos, so they commissioned um, animators to produce these, like, three to five minute shorts, which are playing on monitors, and I just have a couple of screen grabs. Um, and it imagines a conversation, which I don't know if it really happened or happened this way, certainly, between Upali here on the right, the, the head Siamese ordination conferring monk, and Sadanankara, uh, the novice who sort of orchestrated from the Kandian side this entire thing. Um, and it's full of these really affective tones. We were lamenting the disappearance of Buddhism in our motherland, um, echoing Damrong's discourse. It was successful precisely because of the grace of the Buddha, these, uh, these kind of protective Dharmic discourses of virtuous people doing virtuous things. But not only that, the patronage of our two monarchs. Um, this is an interesting one. Our nations, this is a, you know, at least in English, certainly an anachronistic political concept, are determined to continue exchanging Buddhist knowledge. Um, and here we have uh, Prince Damrong himself uh, with his, you know, own uh, court behind him, um, saying that the support of the Sangha in Lanka is a duty and an honor that Siamese Buddhists gladly and willingly accept. Um, yeah. Do we have a, is there a question? Claire Elliott had a question in the chat. Yeah, great. I don't, let me see if I can. 
access it. Claire, can you hit us with your question? Yeah, yeah. I um, well, then you started to answer it, so maybe we can wait. Um, but when you were when when you'd answered uh, uh, David Schultz's question about the uh, Lanka, understanding it that way as well, I wondered if you saw any modern conflict between the way the Thai and the Sinhalese are understanding the roles of their nations in that history, like how they are how they're presenting that history differently in the two countries, and if there's a conflict um, in their understanding of their roles for like the broader global Cessna. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is a great question, thank you. And one that I'm still, I think, thinking through, and I think where the answer lay, uh, or maybe where we find the answer is just in the directionality of this discourse. So what I wanna try and do is trace how Dom Rong's story, story maybe makes it back into Lonkin spaces and has the potential to sort of color those understandings or vice versa. Now I will say that we know for sure that Dom Rong was reading Vamsa literature. Um, I spent quite, a, you know, several days, the better part of a week in the Prince Dom Rong Library in Bangkok and, you know, looked through like everything that he had. And he was reading Vamsa literature. He was reading a text called the Siamu um in English. I don't have any reason, we don't have any reason to think that he was able to read Sinhala. Uh, so he was reading Thai and English translations of this literature. Um, and in many respects, he just accepts um, the kinds of terms of Sinhalese proto-ethno-nationalism that you find in these texts. So um, in the chapter that I kind of, I spent some time translating with Professor Haberkorn um, last year, he talks about why Buddhism declines in Lanka and who does he blame? He blames the Portuguese and the Tamils. And he uses the word in Thai, he, Tamin, he transliterates Tamil, Tamin. Um, and so reconstructing where he's getting this uh, to whatever extent um, some of these ethno-religious tensions would have even been salient to him in the period. I don't know. I'm still, uh, you know, thinking with some of those questions. But then once maybe some of his perspectives make it back to Lanka, I mean, imagine, um, you know, imagine the validation that that would receive from, you know, a Thai royal val validating these kinds of ethno-religious prejudices. But I don't have any evidence yet in my sort of gathering of these stories um, that that's the case, but it's something I'm super, super, super keen to, to think about and, and to hopefully uncover some of the just directionality, more details about the directionality um, of these discourses and stories for sure. Thank you for that. Um, okay, this is my last quote, and then, and then I'll shut up, and we can have some Q&A, and then everybody can eat dinner. Uh, so, in the chapter of his text, which really chronicles the early modern decline of Buddhism, and again, Dam Rong um, assigns it to the hands of Portuguese missionaries um, and northern Tamils of the, the Vamsa literature's kind of proto-ethnic xenophobia, he pauses to talk about the events of the so-called um, Damazedi inscription, in which um, mainland Southeast Asian lineages were dependent on and actively sought out the imprimatur of the Lankan dispensation. And I think in a way, maybe uh, this is a nice follow-up to David's question about this. Um, he, Damrong writes that in the Lankan chronicles, and by Lankan chronicles, I'm assuming he can only mean Vamsa literature, in the reign of King Buvekanabahu, um, the Burmese queen Ramati Bodhi of Hongsawadi, uh, let's see, uh, I have a longer quote in my typed paper, so, um, uh, let's see, had Mon monks reordained in Lanka, forcing the monks throughout the kingdom to reordain in that Lankan lineage. Uh, the monks who were left to reordain in that lineage in the next generation were the only ones that he calls uh, the sort of forest monastics. So they weren't like those city monks. They were like the forest monastics, much more virtuous, uh, much more sort of authentic uh, Mahavamsa style practice. Um, so I think what this text suggests, and I'm kind of really reaching out on a limb here, He's describing the 15th century reordination of Burmese monks by their Lankan counterparts who had made the voyage to the Lankan Mahavihara, which um, by then was renowned for its learning, its advanced meditation practices, and its high standards of monastic conduct. 
um, to compress maybe about 20 pages of one of my comprehensive exam papers down into like a few impoverished paragraphs um, as we wrap up, we suspect that by the 18th century, the so-called Theravada Buddhist uh, approach located its textual and ritual genealogies within the doctrinal, doctrinal approaches that crystallized by the 12th and 13th centuries in that Lankan Mahavihara. And again, Theravada probably was only used to describe this, certainly in 1950 World Fellowship of Buddhists, and maybe not so much earlier. So I realize I'm using it uh, somewhat anachronistically. But in the 12th century, this uh, Anuradhapura-centered uh, monastic form uh, secured material and royal patronage over its rival, the Abhayagiri Vihara, and was in a position then to assert that it uniquely had preserved the distinct pedagogical and ritual practices associated with an unbroken and a completely accurate dissemination of a closed, maximally authoritative poly literary corpus. This is a lineage genealogy they then highlighted their own role in, ranging from those nuns and monks present at the first council of the Buddha's death uh, through the medieval period, and perhaps as Buddhist historians like Damrong seek to establish beyond. As that 12th century Mahavihara formation uh, constituted itself as the true inheritor, in scare quotes, of course, and protector of Buddhism, what was then called the Dhamma Vinaya and the Buddha Sasana, it reformulized the Pali Canon in a language inaccessible to non-monastics, in a prestige tongue, claiming that its recensions and commentaries, which were penned by enlightened monks uh, with the soteriological goods of meditative praxis as their own, um, when the Mahavihara then began to falter into the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, the center of this Theravada Pali cosmopolis, to quote Tillman Frosch, drawing on Sheldon Pollock, really began to shift toward mainland Southeast Asia, where Bago, what's now Burma, emerged as a new hot center of learning and intellectual development. Now, by the early 15th century, and these are the events alluded to in this Damrang quote, um, Mon, Sukhothai, Lana, and Khmer Buddhists spearheaded uh, by the Hantawadi king Damazedi and others, increasingly then reformulated their own approaches to monastic Buddhism in line with that Mahavihara um, by seeking reordination from the Lankan Kote Monastery in what's now present-day Kelania, just outside of Colombo. Um, now, what actually constituted the supremacy of that form may have been immaterial. I mean, it's not immaterial, but it may have been immaterial. The fact of receiving ordination in Lanka alone carried an incredibly pr impressive and legitimizing credential. Um, so to sort of wrap this up, in chapters I haven't yet had a chance to translate, Damrong continues to talk about the causes of decline of Buddhism um, on the island whose record of Buddhist lineage continuity had itself once again decayed by the 16th and 17th century, just waiting for the virtuous Ayutthian kings to rescue it. By locating the Ayutthian court then as rescuers of that uh, same Indian Ocean religious current, I think the text works to inculcate wholesome affective states toward those historical actors whose courage and determination have helped to ensure its multi-local dissemination and survival. Uh, so in this Indian Ocean world, the fortunes of late medieval modes of Buddhist kingship became increasingly mediated by contact with European missionaries, merchants, and their commercial, political, and religious ambitions. However, uh, religious and political projects of self-consciously Buddhist identifying elites worked with political and monastics uh, to uh, work with and through these European traders to accomplish their own important projects of religiously inflected statecraft. This set the stage for valuable emic historical perspectives on the decline and reafflorescence of those Buddhist dispensations by the pens of its later historians. Whew. Thanks so much, everybody. This has been really fun. Thank you, Tyler, um, on behalf of all of us. Uh, we have 15 to 20 minutes for um, just open Q&A with Tyler here. So feel free to jump in, anybody who wishes to do so.
while everybody else is uh, thinking of questions, I have a question that was that was such wonderful material. Whoops, I just lost. Did I just lose everybody? I can hear you. I think you're good. Okay. I, I touched something, but okay. So I was thinking through going back that that the lineage had died out in the 11th century, and I was just thinking throughout the irony that they're trying to revitalize Buddhism. Why did it decline? And so you started to comment on that, that Dumrong was uh, going along, that it was the, the Portuguese and the, the, the Tamils. But why, wh what was it about the Portuguese uh, Tamils? It, I kind of want to know a lot more about various explanations for the decline of Buddhism uh, going back 11th century all the way all the way forward. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. That's such a, of course, the Portuguese, right? Yeah, we're not in, in on the island until the 15th century. Um, so that most recent moment of decline, uh, as it was attributed to the hands of the Portuguese, was because of, they were um, much more hostile to Buddhism, especially in the coastal regions than the Dutch. The Dutch were sort of happy uh, to let Kandy do its thing, but the Portuguese, from what I understand, had a much more aggressively missionizing zeal, um, and that tried to make its way much further inland. Um, and so they turned a lot of uh, otherwise Buddhists into otherwise Christians than the Dutch or the British were even interested in doing in the first place, um, from what I understand. Now, of course, that's not, not the only attributed reason for the 18th or late 17th and early 18th century decline. Um, of course, infighting in the Candian court uh, was part of it, disputes over monastic property and succession, um, and probably a whole host of other reasons that uh, you know I'm not super aware of. I wonder, uh, Bruno or Ben, um, is there a big one I'm missing? I mean, just in terms of the Portuguese period or in, or in the yeah. broader? I mean, the, the, you know, the, the very standard uh, explanation for the early decline or for the initial period was the you know Chola uh, invasions. Um, so there's you know, evidence of uh, of the Chola Empire coming down and uh, wreaking havoc in um, in the kingdoms in Sri Lanka. It's definitely worth mentioning that. Um, Given that so much of this material is is used for these kinds of nationalist appropriations, I, I try and 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 in also only being able to tell so many corners of this really you know huge and everyday growing story, um, you know I wanted to maybe de-emphasize some of the the Tamils did it discourse, but of course that was there. I mean a very uh, perhaps flip. Um flip thing to add would be to say that this is just the inevitable decline of the sasana, uh, which Buddhists have always talked about. And, but I think that does maybe point to something that this is not, um, well, it, it is maybe more of a generalized pattern that there, this is something that Buddhists throughout, uh, perhaps even before the 12th century are really concerned about. And um, Alistair mm -hmm. Gornell's new book, he's arguing that actually uh, concerns about decline actually seem to have um, fostered greater interest in renewal as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he's talking about this this period where we do have immediately before like Kalingamaga coming along, destroying the Polonadua kingdom, the establishment of Dabodinia. That's when you have scholar monks perhaps most interested in revitalizing Buddhism, clarifying what they see as the true essence of, of the real Buddhism. Um, so there is perhaps something, I, mean, I hesitate to say cyclical, but uh, the decline of the sasana. Uh, it is inevitable. I was just going to raise that, but of course I'm writing a book on that topic right now too, <laughs> in the modern modern Southeast Asia. But I just I would I so I see it everywhere, um, but I haven't really looked at that sort of um, discourse before you know the the late 18th 19th centuries. So I just I just would flag that too and wonder if that's part of the histories that are, you know, if part of the interpretations that's that is being given, um, because it's at least in the modern period, it's so tied to the notion of revival. Mm -hmm. um, look at uh, I think Alicia's book, you know, really, you know, I, I, and and that's colon that's the other end of the colonial period. Um, 
but her book gives us, you know, such a, a sort of picture of how important that whole notion of decline was as an explanation for what was going on. Mm. Can I, can I just like, I don't know if anyone wanted to say anything else about decline, but I had another question too. I, I would just, oh, sorry. Um, I, I just, on the, on the topic of decline, um, certainly there's other uh, sources in the, the, the period that you're looking at um, that, that, that also tell this story. Uh, that, and maybe you've looked at these sources, but these are these um, Katikavata sources that uh, to Tirti Sri, the king, the Sri Lankan king at the time, uh, wrote two what I've been called monastic constitutions or Katikavata, or he was sort of the patron of two. And this, this theme of decline and that you're talking about is very prominent there. Um, and it's interesting how in the two successive ones that he writes, one in about 1760 and one in um, 17 uh, later, so maybe some, mid 1770s, um, the revival that you're talking about through Upali uh, is really, it's very pronounced in the second one. And that story in crediting a Yutaya as being the source for revival is very prevalent there. And then in subsequent Katikavata, even later Candian kings and, and in the 19th century, you get the same story of decline, which is very, as Anne was saying, is very important for the, for the revival, but then the explanation for the revival is very different, or the, the role of Ayutthaya seems to be downplayed. And maybe you may have looked at those sources, uh, Tyler, but if you haven't there, it's, um, yeah, they might also be helpful for you. Yeah, thank you. I've, I've spent a little bit of time, so Tibatuave and a few of these other um, Kandian envoys who sailed to Ayutthaya and back have written a couple of these travel logs. And from what I understand, Tibatuave was the uh, one Kirti Shri hired, despite his, his sort of role in the assassination attempt, he was one of the chief composers of the sort of update of the Bamsa literature under Kirti Shri's commission, right? So I've who, so my question to you is, who, who were composing these Katikavita? Do we know? Um, how closely were they connected to Kirti Shri and, and, and some of his ilk? Uh, but, I mean, to answer your question, I haven't, I haven't jumped into those texts yet, but it's on, a, it's on my list. Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have great evidence for who wrote them. The texts themselves say they were um, sort of composed through like, councils of... Um, these uh, Karaka Sabahs of um, these executive committees of monks uh, in consultation with, uh, you know, and, the, and then the king sort of takes credit for promulgating them. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Can I shift a little? Um, I, I, you know, really, in a way, going back to David's question, um, but but thinking not about how people thought about themselves, but how they thought about other polities. Mm -hmm. um, so like the Lankans and the Udians, I just wonder about their mutual perceptions of each other in terms of like purity <laughs> and importance in the Buddhist world and as a source of authority and how that shifts over time. And I wonder if Damrong then is in, in the, you know, partly thinking about this revival because I, at least in Cambodia in the colonial period, the Lankans are seen as a real source of authority and purity. So I don't know if that's true for Damrong too. I suspect it is. But then the Ayudians are kind of heroes. The Thais are heroes because here's the source of authority, the, you know, the Sri Lanka or Lanka, and the, the Ayudians have to bring back the ordination lineage or reestablish ordination. So I wonder if he's in a way using it in this sort of double-edged way. Mm -hmm. um, to, to talk about the importance of the Lankans, but also if using that importance, historic importance of the Lankans to bolster the Thai Buddhist purity, the purity of the, you know, of the, of the Thai Buddhists. Yeah, it's really, really great question. Thank you. I think that um, 
let's see. So I'm trying to think of a, one place to start. Maybe one is something that I learned about um, in doing the Bikuni research. And this a Bikuni I met, uh, a, a woman who had just taken the higher ordination had told me that um, she wanted to go from Thailand to Lanka to receive the higher ordination, precisely because the male monastics who were doing these ordinations were in the Siam Nikaya lineage. And that that back in Thailand might give her a little bit closer chance. Of course, this isn't true. And of course, the person I'm talking about is, is Bikuni Tamananda, Chatsuman Kabul Singh, right? But these notions of one another's lineage purity are, you know, oftentimes maybe used to hedge those kinds of bets um, against moments of decline or contestation about lineage validity. Now, in Lanka, in the mid 18th century, it's not yet clear to me what calculus um, the Kandian court would have been making about the purity of Ayutthian monks. From everything I've looked at and a lot of the materials that, you know, we have records between Kandian and Dutch uh, VOC officials. And from what I understand, they wanted any monk. Um, and that they looked to Burma first because that's what they had done in the 11th century, that's what they had done in the 15th, and then again in the 17th century. Um, but the Dutch were not about to get monks from Burma for them. So how and why they settled in Ayutthaya is something that I'm still trying to figure out. I'm working with my friend Lodewijk Wagenaar at the University of Amsterdam, and we're kind of digging through to try and understand that process of negotiation, why they settled on Ayutthaya. Now, for Siam, for, for Ayutthaya itself, definitely. I mean, I think from everything I understand about its own self-constituted lineage transmission story, maybe at the broadest possible level of generality, it came from Lanka, right? Um, in the 13th century, in the beginning of the Sukhothai kingdom. Um, and of course, if there were forms of Buddhist praxis that kind of predated that, that were maybe more esoteric in the periphery, but the sort of dominant state-sponsored Buddhism, starting with Sukhothai, was constructed directly in reference to those Lankan monastic forms. To be able to return that back to the place that it came when it goes into decline, I mean, imagine um, the kind of inter emic Buddhist hermeneutical significance that that would have in terms of, you know, Buddhists will say in Pali, there's a, there's like a phrase, something like the Dharma is itself the most valuable gift. The highest gift is the gift of Dharma or something to that effect. And to return that is like maybe the most virtuous thing um, that can be done in that uh, ethical world. Um, and certainly something that kings and monastics would improve both their own soteriological star and hopefully along the way their own political fortunes in doing. But but the question like what um, Kandy thought of Ayutthaya is something that's super, super interesting. We do have a few, um, Kate Crosby, I think, and, and um, has an article in which we learn that some of the meditation texts that were sent over with the Ayutthaya monks in 1753 and 1756 uh, introduced new forms of, of shamatha and vipassana meditation. Um, as well, we think that um, a lot of the Ayutthaya monks like took a lot of offense at some of the physical comportment and and like behavior of the Kandians monks. Like apparently some of them wore head coverings in the temple and things like that. So there was some negotiation about how to be a monk the right way, as not only was the ordination lineage looked to from Ayutthaya, but these sort of micro practices um, were also implicated in the transmission. Uh, thanks, Ajahn Larry and Professor Cohen, uh, Professor Hildner, and other names, um, and Samita. Father, can I just ask you another question about um, just, yeah, well, thank you for also circulating the long paper, which was fantastic. Um, look, how do you see all this playing out in the bigger dissertation? Yeah. And can you just. Yeah. 
So um, waiting to find out if I get to go into the field this year, both in terms of the out outcomes of grant applications, but of course also, you know, what possibilities for international research are really going to look like. Um, as it stands, the sort of dissertation that my committee and I are settling on is really going to be mostly in the 18th century world to really track these connected political conjunctures between, as I've called them, you know, my three major stakeholders, although maybe four or more, um, and to really kind of get that story updated. I mean, the last person um, I know of who really spent a lot of time with this story was Professor Blackburn in her 2001 book. So there's a lot more material. She wasn't looking in the Dutch archive as deeply as I've been fortunate enough to this year. Um, and she wasn't really invoking as many of the Thai sources. So I'm working with a new framework to kind of retell that story from a much broader connected um, lens and really to think about the implications that that story has for the micro interactions between the VOC and Candy. Um, and I think that's going to be the bulk of the dissertation. And then we're probably going to have an epilogue, a, a substantive final chapter with the, the Damrong material. And then, you know, and then that sets me up, um, you know, for future projects or maybe to go back to the 1070s and figure out uh, what was happening with the Bikunis back then. Who knows? But I don't know if I can add Burmese to the Thai and the Sinhala and the Dutch I'm barely holding together right now. <laughs> I don't know if Killian, if you want to read your question off. I'm not sure when you sent this in the chat. Oh, oh. Yeah. So that's a great question um, about whether or not the conceptual lex lexicon of memory, remembering, and forgetting is going to be useful in telling this story. One of the things that occurred to me when I was in the Wat Tamaram Museum space um, was the sort of like visual representation of those Tamils, those non-ordained Gananansi monks, and those Portuguese with their funny hats, like visually represented for me in the museum. Where do those visual ideas come from? I don't know yet. Um, who were the artists that were commissioned to put these things together? Uh, you know, and in many ways, so you have like this wonderful exhibit. And if any of you have a chance to go to Ayutthaya, please go to this museum. Um, you have this, like the three causes of Buddhist decline, Tamils, Portuguese, and then the Gananansi monks. Um, and then it summarizes it again in a few panels later, and it says, because of Tamils and European colonial encroachment, Buddhism declined, it, like summarizes it again for us in another exhibit. Now, you ask about forgetting and um, remembering. I mean, in the contemporary lexicon of Sri Lanka's ethno-religious politics, they probably would have called Kirti Sri a Tamil. I mean, he comes from this sort of South Indian Shaivite kind of, I mean, he was more Telugu side, but, but he was called a Malabar. Um, and so it was a Tamil king who worked through European colonizers to make this possible in the first place. That's totally elided in, in the representation and curation of the museum exhibits. So I think you maybe have a really good idea of some literature uh, that might help me think through some of these questions because yeah I think you're really onto something. I mean specifically as someone who's been acquiring some familiarity with like sociology of modern European religion I was thinking of um, Danielle Hervieux Léger um, and her book which has been translated into English religion as the chain of memory uh, where these questions of lineage and tradition are really central to her very definition of religion. Um, let me just type the author's and name and the title of the book into the chat. Uh, oh, great. That book came out in the early 90s. I don't know when it was translated, but um, Hervé Léger is still a pretty, you know, central figure in, in, in French sociology of, of religion. Um, so that could be something to look into. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I definitely will. 
Well, with that, we are a little bit uh, past our 5.30 uh, time here. Um, I, don't, I don't have very much more to add. I think we had a good discussion. Hopefully some of this was helpful for you guys and for Tyler as well. Um, thank you, Tyler. I'll just give you a nice little round of applause. Thank you. This has been really great. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, we'll be emailing stuff about future IRG goings on. Um, so please stay in touch. Um, yeah, uh, wishing you the best at the end of end of your semesters, your summer moving forward here. Um, feel free to stick around, chat for a few minutes if you'd like. I'll be around. Tyler, stay. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for you know giving this an hour and a half of your time. I'm I'm so grateful and and just really really excited. And you've given me a lot of really wonderful stuff to think about. Um, and I look forward to not only seeing those of you who I know well um, in real life to bring our five skandas together. I make that joke all the time. Uh, you know when this pandemic passes, but also you know showing up to the center events next year. Hopefully, if uh, you know this allows. Um, yeah, it seems like a really, really phenomenal community. As uh, as I told David uh, when we met earlier this week, Anne and I have had a number of center fellows in uh, her Buddhism class, and they're oftentimes some of our most well-prepared, thoughtful, um, and just genuinely pleasant students to get to teach. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we've just had some really, really amazing students and keep up the good work and I'm really really honored to be just a small part of uh, what the center has been up to this year. Well thank you I hope we can do many more of those phenomenal um, presentations and conversations afterwards so this was this was really good lots of stuff um, so my head is brimming with new ideas and connections um, and networks in a world I'm not familiar with so this was great. Very inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.